Yeah, so I'll start off with a quick introduction since I haven't been around Slug or um, with any reality for quite some time. I'm actually a um, professional Unix systems administrator. That's what I do for a living. I also write systems code. I am not a web guy. This is really important to emphasize. I write drivers for fun. People seem to insist though that things have to be on the web. Now, you might find it's a bit odd that you know, a systems guy, someone who doesn't like the web, is just giving a talk about a, a um, web framework. That's because Rails is not just for web guys. Ah. If you actually want to get stuff, off, so if you actually want to get stuff done without niggling over every little detail, starting with a high order framework like Rails is actually a pretty good idea. Now, Rails is not the only thing in this category. There's plenty of alternatives. Catalyst, Jifty, Jifty seems to claim they have a pony. Um, you know, plenty of um, Python, that's only two. For the esoteric use, you can use small talk. Java's got, well, Java claims they've got some um, easy to use um, MVC frameworks. And the PHP guys seem to prove they can't spell. <laughs> so, um, no, I'm gonna talk about Rails. And we're gonna talk about what they've changed. Now, one of the first things I'm gonna talk about is dependencies. Dependencies are a eternal problem with Rails applications. Now, you know, you might think you've got Rails and that's enough. That's not really the situation. Your typical Rails application pulls in quite a few different packages, or gems as they're called in the, in the um, Ruby world. Some of those gems have their own dependencies. And, well, the problem is, a lot of those dependencies are declared. So, you get this sort of um, dependency creep problem that gets really bad when you then drop it on a new machine and you've got missing dependencies. Now, the first thing that happened in Rails 3 was they introduced Bundler, which is a toolkit for um, taking and isolating gems and the environment for um, Ruby software. Rails is the most, the first big consumer of it. The idea is that on a deployed instance, your Rails application lives with all the gems it requires as its own bundle. The bundler is smart enough that if a gem is actually installed in your system, that it references it in rather than copying it into the um, bundle. However, it doesn't let stuff reference out. So if, it if your bundle, sorry, if your, you know, if your bundle file was correct, then it works, you know, irrespective of you know, where you deploy it. If it's wrong, well, it's not gonna work, but at least you can fix it now. This is, you know, this is contra contrasting to the old days where missing dependencies would, you know, would work perfectly fine on your test environment, but once you threw it out into production, you know, you had to suddenly work out what you forgot. Bundle is actually controlled using gem files, which are nice and straightforward. That's the actual syntax of a gem of a um, simple bundle of control file, which you know, tells it where to look for, for the gems. Which gems it wants? Rails actually, you know, uses Bundler to load itself into the environment. A few other bits and bobs, and you can also specify um, groups. So, um, for instance, this one we're saying that we only need this gem when we're in development or test, but not in production. Okay, we're going to we're moving right along. The other, one of the other things they changed was models, and I'm not talking about the human kind. There's actually some really big changes in the way models are handled in Rails. Um, in the past, models have been, um, the way things have worked is as systems, um, there are various little subcomponents in Rails. One of these is called Action Pack, which handles um, things like um, routing and um, event dispatch. So if you ask for a, um, for a path to a given object, Action Pack knew about the objects, would map it back and um, give you a URL which would link to that object. Now, this was actually mostly done by magic. Magic is never a good thing. So if anyone ever wanted to rip out the, um, the um, ORM, which happens a lot, really, um, you had to go off and work out what all the magic called. And none of this was well defined. In Rails 3, this was actually all um, st um, standardized. There's now the active model interface, which defines a fairly simple you know, API. And, um, Yes, yeah, sorry, and um, also stripped out things like validations from um, active record. So now with a um, one line of code, you can actually get active record style validations in your in your active model model. And moving right along, 
on topic of models, we have active record. Now, as I mentioned, validators. Validators have a very straightforward syntax in Rails. Um, we ask, when you, in your model, when you've defined, um, when you actually want to define that something is validated, we had a number of um, validates, presence of, uniqueness of, numericality of, you know, association of, and a whole bunch of other different, you know, something of validators. Well, each one, you know, checks, will check a nominated field for something particular. These tend to pile up a bit over time. And so um, new test syntax were introduced to make this much shorter and briefer. This also now works with custom validators. So if you write a validator to make sure that, you know, a string begins with M or something, which you don't need to do anyway, but if you do, um, you can actually reference it by its name in the um, validate statement, and it'll find it and use it. One of the other things they got overhauled in Active Record was actually the um, use of ARL. Now, this was a traditional Rails 2 query. You want to find all the users who are marked as active and have email, you know, with a certain suffix. The problem with this was if you're passing things around through um, different layers of the controller, this got awfully messy fast. You'd have to pass things around or partial queries or deal with the mess. Now, in Rails 3, we have a new system called, um, what's it called? It's called RL. It's, oh, I forgot what it actually stands for. Anyway, the, um, the bottom line is, is that we have a new query syntax. And it's a query syntax can, that can be executed in parts. So we, um, the system is smart enough now to take things like where and group them. If you call successive where's in the same result on a result, it can apply order, you know, late. And no SQL is actually sent until you make, until you attempt to actually iterate the first element out of it. This makes complex searching and, um, and um, various refactoring quite easy. Okay, one of the next things, routes. Okay, so we've got controllers, we've got actions, we need a way to find them. And in um, Rails 3, well, Rails 2, our old route syntax, this is a typical real application, um, one that we actually develop, use at my work, um, can get a bit complicated. Um, heavy use of hashes to pass arguments and lots of um, yield blocks. The new router syntax is substantially easier to read. Heavy use of real yield blocks, but no longer passing around variables. And that's substantially more readable. We can see that we've got resources, you know, matters, which have entities, documents, and so on. Not going too fast, am I? That's good. Okay. Let me get up to the bit where I'm actually not too sure about what's changed. <laughs> mail. I don't use the mailing functionality in Rails very much but it's actually one of the biggest areas of change in Rails 3. Now, the, um, the Sydney-based author, uh, Michael, I believe the name is, um, decided that um, Rails 3 was a good time to rip out T-Mail. T-Mail was the, um, the mail processing framework that's been in Rails now for, sort of, since I think one point something. It's been there for a long time. It's not particularly pretty. It, making an email or generating an email requires a horrible lump of code like this. Whereas the new solution, which he also wrote, um, looks a lot neater. Um, this is one of the things I am looking forward to actually playing with more in time. Okay, so I seem to have gone way too fast. <laughs> Let's talk useful stuff. Now, um, one of the biggest problems I've found with trying to use Rails, particularly on Linux, one of the reasons why I use, I use my Mac for this talk and for any demos I'm going to run after, is that the Ruby Gems maintainer decided to ignore the, the FS standard and made shit up. And as a result, Ruby Gems doesn't do what you expect it to do, and hence it's very hard to install new versions of Rails. There actually is a pretty easy solution to this. The Ruby version manager, or RVM, provides a nice neat way to install as many copies of Ruby, JRuby, you know, RBX, or any of the other variants on your machine, alongside your system installed packaged you know, Ruby, 
and pick the one that you want to use now. It also has support for managing various gem sets. Um, so you, you know, this, probably, this slide I showed earlier where you've got um, all the gems bundled in. Um, RVM actually has its own mechanism for isolating, isolating those gems into their own little sets and keeping them separate from each other. Very useful. Um, if you're using Ubuntu or Debian and want to do Rails, I strongly recommend using it. It will save you a lot of headaches. Now, one of the other things I use a lot is a rather neat little markup language called Haml. Haml, take, um, Haml is great for people who hate to write HTML. I'm one of these people. This is why I'm not a web guy. I find it horribly repetitive. Wait, look at the, a typical small chunk of HTML with the IV tags in it. And there's an awful lot of repetition in that. Actually, there's a hell of a lot of repetition in that. Haml simplifies this down to very nice, simple, structured text. It even handles things like um, the iteration in ERB, um, where we want to use a repeat block to get stuff done. Handles with a great deal of elegance, using the um, blocking to um, start and stop the um, iterators. Now, one of the other things that we do a lot of in web applications is authentication. Fortunately, people have solved this problem far too many times over. AuthLogic is one such solution. It's reasonably flexible. We use it to back, we actually back end AuthLogic onto LDAP. And other people have back end, have used plugins to talk to, talk to OAuth. Currently, it's working reasonably well with Rails 3, but you know, it should be there in about another month, I think. Now, the other, one of the other problems is um, with web design or web programming is um, deferred jobs. Now, RISQ is a nifty little um, toolkit um, developed actually by the GitHub guys. So, one of the problems is if you, do, if you have a web controller or a web action that has to do a great deal of processing and um, you want to provide it near immediate feedback, you need a way to actually offload that and do it in the background somehow. Rescue provides that functionality. Not only does it provide that functionality, it gives you a nice little web interface to see what your workers are doing. And um, web app theme, for those of us who really hate writing HTML, is a series of um, nifty form generators which produce nice, pretty looking interfaces with almost no effort. Anyway, now so who has actually seen a trivial RAL application being built? No one? Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, let's make this a really quick demo. That readable? Okay, the first thing we generally do when we make a um, Rails application is we actually ask it to build the trust. So um, Rails provides a nice little shell script, or a nice little script called Rails, which does a lot of this stuff. So we'll ask it to make us a new trust called Slug Demo. It's going to go off and do its thing. And being a nice friendly script that it is, it actually tells us what it's done. So what we've now got we've now got is a directory which has a number of got a directory, number of subdirectories, each of which contains a major component of a Rails truss. We've got the um, app directory which contains the actual bits component to your application. So your models, your controllers and your views live there. Config which configures your truss um, and sets up all the um, specifics of how Rails behaves. 
public, which is a directory full of um, static assets, which can be served by the server. Script, which used to be really full in Rails 2, and is now very empty in Rails 3, used to controls or contains all the scripts for actually manipulating the truss and setting up new controllers and models. And the most, most of the other things you can ignore you know, when you're starting out, but the important one's going to be app and um, DB. DB contains the database and the migrations. So we've got an empty um, Rails application. You can start the server up. And right. <laughs> oh, wait a second, that was wrong. That should fix it. There we go. And a brand new, freshly set up Rails application. Um, actually has a couple of static pages in it and a, um, which can tell you about what's actually running in the background. Yes, this really is a Mac. Um, so this is telling that we're running on Ruby 187, which is the current 1.8 stable. Um, but we have you know, Rails 3.0.1, which is the current Rails stable. We don't care about this. Let's just get our application built. Now, um, the traditional one, um, or two model um, demo is a blog. I'm not going to do that. Um, let's just do a um, DVD or video catalog or something similar. So we ask Rails to generate a scaffold, which generates a model and a scaffolding controller at the same time. Um, we're going to fill it full of items. And items have titles, descriptions, maybe a UAN or um, whatever, uh, UPC. I can't remember what we're involved in this country anymore. And um, we can ask it to go off and do that, and it will spit out a whole bunch of code for us. Um, and a um, basic database migration, which is the first thing we need to do when we build a model. So if we look at the actual migration, we've got here a um, description of how to actually create the table items and how to uncreate it. Migrations will always provide both directions. So, and this is the reason for this is the idea is that any migration can be reversed. If you don't want that to keep that change or if you ever need to actually make changes to that change, you can merely back it out and run it, you know, and reapply it. So this one creates our um, items table and creates those three fields and also includes the magical timestamps. Timestamps are actually kind of, kind of handy, but they're there because um, Active Record knows about them and will update. And they include things like last, the created date and time, the modified date and time. We don't need to worry about it. We'll just leave them there. So now that we've got that, we um, ask Rails to um, migrate the database. There we go. It's now created our table. One thing we need to check is that the controller got connected. Create the resources route. So it's been routed, which means I'll start the server. We have our trivial database already. And that's literally how easy it is. doesn't get a great deal harder than that either. Any questions? Seriously? Anyone? Web app theme, yeah, okay. Okay, web app theme for theming this trivially. To do that, we'll need to pull in web app theme. We ask bundlers to install what we've just asked for. It's done. The 
you ask Rails what it can generate, and there's the new WebEt theme stuff. So it's generate for control, um, the themed objects. Sorry? Oh, a conflict, okay. When I was running the, ge the generators just there, they were overwriting the views. So it immediately asks me, do I actually want to continue? It gives me the option to stop at that point um, and abort to prevent changing anything I want to keep. Um, I generally don't worry about those things. I run under, I usually run under version control. So I can just back out any changes. Um, but it's really handy if you don't have that luxury. As you can see, we now have a slightly prettier trivial database, complete with um, complete with um, placeholder blocks. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Requests? Anyone? Ah. You can pick your database. Um, I'm using, well, the default is, is SQLite, mostly because it's hand, handy, useful, works out of the box. Don't need to set anything up. Don't need to set anything up for it. It does have some drawbacks, and you need to be aware of them when you're using it. But all in all, it works pretty well, just for development. Now, you can quite easily switch to using MySQL or Postgres if you want to. There is even a drive for Oracle if you're crazy. And I believe someone recently got MSSQL working with it too, under Linux. <laughs> yes, there was a um, driver re um, release re recently to speak um, the MSSQL tabular data stream format. So. Yep. Yes and no. The basics I picked up, the basics of Rails are easily picked up and usually in about an hour or two. Actually getting comfortable at doing more complicated things can take a while. Um, there is a very good book published by, um, by um, Pragmatic Press called um, Agile Web Development with Rails, which I can highly recommend. Um, I believe it's getting, or well, the current edition I think doesn't cover free, but there will be a new one coming out soon. They tend to release pretty quickly after new Rails releases. So, and you can also buy beta copies of the um, book, which are also quite handy. Um, I also recommend picking up, um, if you're new to Ruby, um, picking up a copy of um, Programming Ruby, also by um, Craig Prog, which um, covers all the little details you will need to know about the language, specifically those ones that no one ever bothers to mention to you. Ah, because I don't like Python very much either. <laughs> this, 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 this inherent, okay, when I said I'm a systems program, I'm really not kidding. I write mostly C when I'm not doing you know, professional work that requires me to do web stuff. Um, the white space nature of Python drives me up the wall. It really does. Um, I've written Python, you know, at parts of my professional life, and I can do it. I just don't like it very much. <laughs> There's also a secondary problem, that every time I try to use um, um, pylons, everyone points to SQL Alchemy. SQL Alchemy does not fit as nicely with pylons as um, Active Record does with Rails. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, it compil well, it's compiled internally by Ruby. Um, or by the Hamel code into a Ruby object, which can, then gets executed, um, which produces the HTML. It's a template system. It's part of the, um, it's actually a drop-in templating engine, which can be used in place of ERB, which is the default one that, Ruby use, that Rails uses. Any more questions? Please, keep them coming. <laughs> Uh, 
I think that's it. I have no more slides. <laughs>